Take a seat, take a seat. Hello. Now, Paul, uh, uh, you started driving your mum's Ford Focus. Yes. And ten years later, you bought yourself a Lamborghini Huracan. This is correct. That is correct. As so, weird as that sounds. So, uh, uh, just to educate everybody, I mean, uh, for what answer, so what, you, you, you just get your phone out, do you? And just do this a bit. That's exactly it. Right. And then you buy a Lamborghini Huracan. It's not as simple as that sounds. No. But it's kind of like that. <laughs> that actually looks like one of my videos as well. They're super shaky and just running around trying to chase cars. But you called your YouTube channel the Supercars of London, but I, I presume the first car you had to film was Mum's Ford Focus, which isn't exactly a supercar. <laughs> how, how did you get your hands on a supercar to start this channel? My channel was Supercars of London because I started filming these Ferraris and Lamborghinis driving past, so I never asked the owner whether I could film the cars, I just filmed them. So I didn't necessarily need the access to the cars, they were already there in Knightsbridge. I never once filmed my mum's Ford Focus. Uh, I don't think the audience would be that interested in it, but she still owns it now. And, uh, yeah, so from there. So then, I mean, how do you monetize this? I mean, just do YouTube just send you a billion pounds a week in the post? I mean, <laughs> how, does the, how does the system work? You, you started off, I presume, doing it as a hobby. Exactly. So when did you first, I mean, how many years before you earned any money out of your hobby? Well over six years. So when I started, YouTube wasn't owned by Google, so there was no adverts. I was purely posting pictures for and videos for people to watch. And then when Google took over, I actually submitted a business plan to Google for them to monetize my YouTube channel. Whereas now, you can literally click a button on your channel and get adverts on it, which is the problem with YouTube at the moment with all of the news. So, but it's... it's took a long time, but what do, you, what do you think the secret, I mean, so many, you see so many kids going around now, you know, obviously trying to do what you do, but uh, you've established yourself, uh, what's the secret of that success, do you reckon? It's so cool, I think one of the coolest things about what I do is seeing the community grow and seeing young kids out filming these cars and sharing a passion of cars. Um, starting very early and the consistency that I've had over the last 10 years because I have been doing it for 10 years and probably not had a life for 10 years because I've been either on a laptop or in London every time I went to London I'd have to walk around 15 miles to try and capture whatever I could see and I never knew because there was no Instagram or Twitter whereas now you get to see the cars before you even go to London so Definitely the time that I started was the best time to start, but then the consistency over the 10 years, because I started it as a hobby before there was any money involved, the fact that money involved now is a bonus, but I'd still be doing it if there was or no money. But you did much equipment, I mean, now obviously you've grown, you do quality film, but you started literally with the phone, did you? I mean, but now you do need a, a, what, a software for editing and a couple of cameras, a few GoPros. What sort of kit have you now got grown in your cupboard? Yeah, the equipment started out as one of the most earliest camera phones that literally went and the car had already passed the frame, so I kept missing them. So I bought a phone that had video recording now I use uh, just a standard DSLR camera and I've got two GoPros that I just move around the car as I'm driving. So my, my equipment has definitely advanced in the last 10 years, but Supercars of, London, Supercars of London was kind of known for pretty average quality to low quality. There are a few videos out there that are pretty dodgy. You can probably count the pixels in the YouTube video. And um, I mean, you have to put up what, what length? Is that a sick? I, I look at some of them, it's like sort of 30 minutes. I started watching one, I get bored after you. Know. <laughs> have you found there's a happy length for these posts that you try to stick to a certain formula? Or does it depend on what you're filming on that each day? Yeah, it really depends on the level of quality of the content that you've got. Some videos might be five minutes, some videos might be 15 minutes. Um, I recently took a trip around Italy and I spent three days filming and managed to condense it into 20 two minutes which seemed quite a long time but the video went down really well so I was pleased with the response that it got. What about borrowing car? How long did it take before anyone would lend you a car? I mean you were still only about 12 I think when you started. I mean, you weren't even driving cars when you when you began this project. Yeah it's, it, it was definitely a long process to get manufacturers to buy into the exposure that was the potential on my channel 
but it also took me a long time to get to 25 years old so that the insurance would actually cover me to drive these cars. So to begin with, I was limited to my Vauxhall Astra, which was the first car that I bought, or my mum's Ford Focus. No one wanted to see that on Supercars of London, as you would imagine. So it was a case of like knocking on dealership doors and saying, have you got a car that I can drive? And it started off with Audi S3s, it started with TTs, and most recently I drove a McLaren 720S, which blew my mind. <laughs> I've never had a proper job in your life, I presume. <laughs> no, no, no. I did a paper round. I worked uh, a couple of retail stores. I worked um, a few jobs. I worked in a hotel. And I worked for HR Owen, who were down there. So I sort of got myself into the supercar world pretty quickly. Uh, found out that it can be sometimes not as glamorous as it looks, but it's good fun to be involved in cars. So presumably this is a global thing now, I mean you've got Americans, I mean you're in America, the Americans are over here, I mean, are you going to get knocked off your, is it very competitive, or have you like established yourself and you think you can keep your elbows, I mean all that, he's going to go home now isn't he, he's going to yeah. put his phone on, he's going to beat you, he'll have more, more viewers than you. How many people are you competing against across the world? Do you know what? I think YouTube, the community of YouTube is that there's no rivalry, there's no competition. Uh, because the shift in media and YouTube is you can watch these videos whenever you want. So you can sit at half eleven at night when you're going to bed and watch a video. Or you can see them when they get uploaded. So there's no real competition. And the community and the car space on YouTube is actually really strong. So I know the guys out in the US and we film together. I know all of the guys in the UK, we film together, and it's just a real fun vibe and atmosphere. So you they're can... all friendly, I can't stand that. <laughs> Fat Skip Clarkson, who's got all the, you know, all the TV works. We have to compete on television, you're all friendly with each other. Yeah, I was recently on a road trip with four, five, maybe six other guys, and we were all creating videos. Although the, the one difficulty now is because we're all creating videos around the same thing, we've got to kind of find our own angles and work on how to differentiate our content so that everyone enjoys each channel. But then where do you go next? I mean, now you've had this success and you've joined supercars. I mean, do you see yourself, you know, being commissioned to create a TV commercial for Lamborghini with, you know, 10 cameras and 20 crew? Do you have that sort of ambition or do you quite like just doing what you're doing? I don't think I'm... I don't think I'm good looking enough to be in a Lamborghini commercial. <laughs> and film it, be the director of it, you know, oh, creator, no. creator of a TV with a one million pound budget, you know, do you sort of... Oh. I dreamt, I think when I was about 12 or 13, I always dreamt of, that I would turn up to school when I was old enough to drive in a Lamborghini. And I kind of missed the boat by about six years, but the fact that I am living my dream. Have you driven back to show the headmaster? Is he still at your school? Have you I haven't, no. I don't know why I haven't done that, actually. It'd be a good video. <laughs> but, yeah. The Paul returns to school with his Lamborghini. Yeah. I'm sure the kids would enjoy it. So, so, you don't think of branching out into other filming areas particularly? You I, I, to be honest, as long as it involves cars, supercars, or general cars, I'd be out for doing pretty much anything, whether that be television, or I've, I've actually been on radio a couple of times, which was an interesting experience, because I realized that no one's actually, no one, no one cares, because they're not looking at it, they're, they're hearing, so I had to be a little bit better with my words, but no, I'm definitely up for television, or anything that comes my way that involves cars, that means that I get to enjoy, and continue to enjoy what I'm doing. And that's, I'll be up for it. I've read somewhere that you, you help celebrities buy cars. I mean, don't they know where car showrooms are, celebrities? Do, uh, they, you help celebrities, is this true? Yeah, I've done a couple of videos with people that are well known uh, on television or in normal, traditional celebrity uh, levels. And because they're so busy in what they do, so I've got a friend that's in the group Diversity, Dancer, and he's just come off tour and he's continuously on the road in a tour bus. He only ever gets to watch these videos on YouTube to see what new cars are available, so, but he wants to buy them. So he calls me up and he's like, what do you think of this? What do you think of this? And because I spend all of my time around these cars, I kind of have a better perception of it other than just watching a YouTube video. So I recently did a video with Joel Domit, who is a comedian. And he, had, he has no idea about cars, but he's so busy that he hasn't got the time to do any research. So we shoot some fun videos and hopefully we can uh, get him into something a little bit faster than what he's currently got. Cool. But what about if someone tries to join your work? Do you think you've almost got a closed shop? You know, the big guys are up there. And I mean, how long has it taken the most recent sort of competitors to come up? 
could you create a, a market in two years, three years? How long do you think it net would now take someone starting out? That's a difficult question to answer because it seems that like some of the some of the people that are coming up now grow so much faster than I grew. So it took me six years to get a hundred thousand subscribers, and then it took me another three months after that to get two hundred thousand subscribers. So it is a massive snowball effect once you start picking up momentum you can really grow quickly and some of the newer guys that a lot of you guys are probably familiar with Mr. JWW, Archie Hamilton, those guys um, have grown super super quick and it's nice to see them we're always welcoming new people in that just love doing it. It's not young Archie Hamilton, the Hamilton son that used to try to be a racing driver, the son of, of Duncan Hamilton. It is. Oh, that, oh Archie's doing it now. Yeah. He's, not, <laughs> he's recently bought a Corvette and I just keep saying, have fun in those car parks because they're left-hand drive cars and he's got to reach across to try and get a ticket. Well, Archie's dad's got a showroom full of about every dream show car. So he's got, I mean, that's the difference. I mean, some of these guys come up, they're actually rich kids that, you know, started off by filming Daddy's Ferrari and Uncle's Lamb I mean, you, you had to really struggle without any obvious supercars. So that's a bit of an advantage, so I suppose, if you're a moneyed YouTuber. Yeah, I, I mean, I was buying child tickets on the London Underground up until I was about 18 years old. I got stopped a couple of times, but it cost two quid rather than eight. So that's what I used to do. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's been a lot of fun. It's also been a hard graph to get to where I am, but... The, the it's graph a, it's doesn't a, stop. It is a shame you stuff to wear second-hand clothes. I do appreciate yeah. that as well. Never mind. <laughs> yeah. It's trendy, apparently. Yeah. Have you got any, any questions for Paul? Um, yes, there's a YouTuber down there. Do you have any tips for an aspiring YouTuber like me? Does he have any tips for an aspiring? See competition there, front row. <laughs> I think the best, the best tip that I will always give to anyone that's <laughs> wanting to. Is this your camera? Yeah. Well, this is what you do. All you do is you pick up your camera, right? And you go up, 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 and do a bit of years and yas. Then you go London Motors Show. You zoom it in and out. You just look at the back of my head. Then you pan round the audience. You see, and then you shake the camera a bit, and then yeah, you go like that. Shake the camera, and that's right. it. And then all you do is as you load that up, and you'll have a hundred thousand uh, followers, and you'll be pushing him off the top. I tell you, easy. <laughs> The best tip is definitely consistency. So find something that you enjoy doing, not necessarily what you think will be successful on YouTube, because there are a lot of successful people on YouTube, but find a niche that, of someone that hasn't done something and, uh, and be consistent at it, because the way the algorithms work on the internet without boring people is the more consistent you are, the better you're going to be building a platform and the more people are going to start seeing your videos and that's the best way to get exposure on YouTube. So consistency and, and find a niche that no one's done before. Who else? Yes. Uh, Tom Exton. Yes. Tom Exton. Tom uh, Exton. What would be your best and worst part in zone? Oh, okay. So, Tom, what's this question? Can you repeat the question? So a friend of mine is uh, a lad called Tom Exton. And he seems to buy and sell supercars quicker than I buy clothes. Um, his best car, I'd probably say his F12 is his best car. It is just a stunning, stunning V12 with a perfect exhaust system that makes that car sing. And it does all of the good things. It does the GT drives, but it also is pretty nimble around the hairpins. His worst car, I don't know. That's a good shout. His Land Rover Defender, because I'm just... Not about that life. <laughs> They're awful things, though. So people think that you don't like Defender either. No. I know, most of you know, Credit Wills, I love them. Defenders, Defenders. Defenders are clique that love Defenders. I've no idea. I'll come to you next to the white shirt. One gentleman here. Uh, as soon as you've helped friends buy cars, do you think that's something that could interest you further in the future, buying and selling cars, perhaps? Yeah, I think spending other people's money is what I enjoy doing as much as trying to spend my own money. But... It's so much fun to start learning and understanding different opinions. When I was a lot younger, I was very naive to think that my opinion and sort of what I thought was nice, everyone else assumed. So when I was a lot younger in London, I used to love filming Lamborghinis and Ferraris because they look good and sound good and hated seeing Porsches because there were so many of them, but they sounded pretty poo. But now I understand why Porsche is such a fantastic car, such a fantastic driver's car, and they do sound good, and they are a great fun to drive. So, just meeting so many different car people and different opinions is something that 
I actually really enjoy. So I wonder whether it would be an actual series on my YouTube channel of helping other people buy cars, because I think it would be quite interesting to see where it would go. Yes, in the middle. How much planning has to go into each video? That's a good not question. A not a lot, he just turns it off and walks around. <laughs> it's obvious, it's obvious. Um, how much planning goes into a video? It really depends because there's obviously a bank of content and video ideas that I've got in the back of my head and I've probably got a list that is longer than my arm and my iPhone that is just general ideas or concepts that I've either seen on YouTube or things that I want to tweak and make better. Um, but there's so much time when I'm driving, so when I was on my road trip over the last two weeks, we're driving for about nine or ten hours a day and only filming around two or three. So there's so much time that I have by myself to just come up with different ideas, things that might work, and I suppose the only drawback to YouTube is that my mind never switches off. And it's the one thing that my girlfriend hates the most is at 3 a.m. I'm on my phone writing down another video idea that I've had. So it really can depend on how long it takes from a video to start here and actually make it onto YouTube. But it's, it's just an interesting process how my mind works and how I come up with a video idea and then it actually turns into a video. I can't believe he's got a girlfriend, personally, but never mind. <laughs> Spending all that lifetime. Yes, Yali. Oh. Um, basically, I've watched quite a few of your videos, and I've noticed that you and your friends change your cars quite often. Is it possible for you to do an advice video doing those like quite quick finances that you guys seem to do? Yeah, I um, don't own them for long, because they've nicked them, and they've got to give them back, <laughs> you see. Is it... I know that some of them they let you try them out, like the Mercedes the other day, or yesterday, or whatever it was. Mercedes AMG or something like that. Yeah, I drove the AMG before I bought it. But yeah, yeah I was just wondering how you do those finances and how do you switch it so quick? It's, it's, there's so many different finance solutions to cars and they are quite generic. There's not actual options for short term loans. I change my car when I want to change my car. Um, and it usually either depends on that I've been offered a very good price for it, uh, or I'm actually looking to change. And I, my probably the worst trait that I have is I get bored quite quick. Um, so I owned my R8 for about 18 months. I owned my first Lamborghini for about six months. And the Mercedes after that, I wanted to own for about two years and I always had a plan of owning it for about two years and someone came along and offered me the same money that I paid for it ten months ago so I had to take the, I had to take the deal but there's definitely an opportunity to make a video that actually gives advice to people that are looking at doing these sorts of things but you can go to pretty much anywhere to test drive a car and it's rare that I get preferential treatment to borrow a car for longer than a normal test drive but maybe there's a video idea in that so thank you. Yes sir. Um, if you won the lottery, which hype car would you buy? <laughs> Good question. You know what? I actually bought lottery tickets today because this morning I drove an Aventador S and it is one of the best cars that I've driven. And so I turned to um, the sales manager at Lamborghini Pangborn and I said to him, I want this car so bad I need to buy lottery tickets. What hyper car would I buy if I won the lottery? I'd probably buy the LaFerrari. As great as the P1, 918, Bugatti Chiron R, for me, the LaFerrari is the pinnacle of cars. Blimey, for the first time today, I've agreed with him. <laughs> A winner, the LaFerrari. Yes, young man. Um, who or what inspired you to do YouTube? That's a really, really good question because how I stumbled across YouTube is probably quite different to how people will find YouTube now. I use YouTube as a storage facility, so I used to film my videos on my phone, I used to run out of memory all of the time, so I went and uploaded them to my computer, my family computer, ran out of memory on that, so I started to upload to YouTube just so that I could delete them and free up some memory on my phone to go out and film some more, and that was how I found YouTube. So there's not necessarily an inspiration to it, and the fact that it's my hobby and my motivation and it's what I get up and love. That's why I've continued doing it for so long because I love it and I got involved before there was money involved. So it's just so much fun. But now I watch a lot of YouTubers and there's so much cool stuff out there that you could watch YouTube for days. Yes. 
Um, where can you see yourself in like five years' time in terms of YouTube and the cars that you own? Where do I see myself in five years' time? Oh, such a difficult question. I think going back to talking to Tiff and sort of dreaming when I was 12, 13, 14 years old that I was going to own a Lamborghini. The fact that I own it now, I kind of just still want to be in a Lamborghini. So maybe in five years time I'm driving the latest Lamborghini and doing what I do now, which is just sharing my passion for cars with everyone that watches it on YouTube. There you go. Next. I don't need the mic, I've got question ha is is it is owning a supercar as good as I expected it to be is that the question um, I would say I would say yes it's, it's very it's a pinch yourself moment driving these cars and it's very easy to look over the steering wheel and look out just onto the standard road that you would see in any car but owning a supercar the one thing that I never actually expected that I would feel when driving these amazing cars is just the weight on your shoulder of what happens if something goes wrong and you got to pay for it. I think that's, that's the one thing that I've realised that I didn't expect would happen. But it's a scary thought driving these expensive cars, some of them that aren't mine, and knowing how much these cars cost. And if something does go wrong, then yeah, it's bad news. Nasty idea. Uh, it's, it's, um, so it's not a question, it's probably something that I would like to hear from Paul. Um, what if you followers and viewers, they think that uh, YouTubers uh, with supercars, they made all this money out of YouTube. I think it's, uh, it's important for the YouTubers to explain to the kids that this is not purely YouTube money. Out of the 10 YouTubers, probably 8 out of 10, they have a family background, family money funds, etc. which supports these, uh, these their channels, they change the cars, etc. And I think it's probably it's Paul and a couple of more guys who have uh, made the money out of YouTube. It, I think it's important to explain to the kids that are watching you, they're following you, that this is not it's not an easy task. You're not filming, you're not making 100,000 views and suddenly you come up with a, with a Lamborghini. It's, it's a slightly different story from what kids think is and uh, the, the perception of how you can be successful, how you can make all these uh, supercars is... Uh, he, yeah, we did touch that. We did touch that. I did say that uh, you know not everyone can come up and be the man like that. But yeah, you do have to. It's a warning. Yeah, you've yeah. got to start doing kids' warnings. <laughs> Otherwise, they'll stop doing their GCSEs and their A levels because they all think they can diddly do and have a Lamborghini. So you give these kids a warning now. I think um, a lot of people that watch my videos or content on YouTube in general, they'll watch the ten minutes and assume that's how long the video took to make, which is just not the case. Um, not only that, about seven years into my YouTube channel, I'd be happy if a video hit 5,000 views. And that's seven years of doing the same thing every single day, filming different cars, but just fundamentally spending my own money to go and see these cars, to film them, in the hope that one day I might actually have a video that hits a million views or 100,000 views. So to sit here now and watch the views creep up on all of my videos that I create is kind of mind-blowing and kind of surreal and, and very overwhelming. Even to sit here in front of all of you guys today, like, I'm not used to this. I'm used to talking to a camera and it's normally just myself and my camera. So apologies if I'm a little bit awkward. Um, but it is a long slog. But the fact that this is my passion and the fact that I just enjoy doing this kind of makes it feel like it's not my work. Um, and that is by far the most important thing to take away, if you're listening, is just follow your dreams or follow your passions. It doesn't matter what other people think. A lot of my friends were borrowing their older brother's fake ID to go clubbing because that was what was cool at the time. And I actually just used to sneak away and go up to London and chase cars around. As weird as that sounds, but now there is such a cool community out in central London, around the world, and on Instagram and across social media, of like-minded car people, that it's almost acceptable now to be filming these amazing supercars as they drive around. So, it is a hard slog, 
and there are many sacrifices that I've probably taken over the last 10 years to get to this point, but I wouldn't change it for the world and I don't have many regrets. So thank you for the question and hopefully I've summed it up. Right, two more. One here and one in the middle and that's we're done. Yes, young man. When you have completed your dream and when you've got all the supercars you've ever wanted, what would you do next? <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Buy an island in the Caribbean? There's no roads on there though. <laughs> Build them. Yeah. You know? <laughs> um, do you know what? That's, that's actually a very good question because at the, I'd, I'd spent so long trying to achieve my goal of, turn, of buying a Lamborghini before I turned 25. And let me get this straight, I had absolutely no idea how I was going to do it. I just had this weird fascination of owning a Lamborghini before I turned 25 and I had no idea that it would actually happen. Um, but once I bought that, and I was making all of these awesome videos on the car. Inside, I'd kind of almost lost a bit of direction as to where I was going because I'd achieved what I'd set out to do. Um, and only recently, with the videos that I've been making and the opportunities that I've been getting and the road trips that I've been going on, have I, have I started to understand a little bit more about the direction I want to take things in. And really, I just want to continually better myself and better my content to make sure that I'm constantly evolving and producing videos that my audience want to watch. So that's it. I think every day, just wake up and try and be a better version of helicopters. What I was Start doing helicopters. Helicopters of London. Buy your first helicopter. <laughs> you're 35. I actually did say that I wanted to buy a Lamborghini Aventador or a V12 Lamborghini by the time I was 30. So that's probably the next goal. Right, final question. Better be, better be good now. Pressure's on you. <laughs> so, since Top Gear sort of fell down... So, sorry, what? <laughs> <laughs> What's he talking about? I never heard no, 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 top, no. top Gear? No, I don't know what he's talking about. Yeah, continue. Um, sort of fell through the floor. Have you ever thought about teaming up with the people that you went to Monaco with and actually suggesting to Netflix or Amazon about saying we could do this as an actual season? Oh, yeah, we have. Um, I think when the automotive space on television and the cha and the, the programs that were there, um, well, Top Gear when it disappeared for the first time, I actually went to the penultimate um, screen uh, filming of, of Top Gear literally just before he punched someone in the face, and um, and it was amazing to see how quickly um, I saw an audience increase in my YouTube channel from people that were looking at and sort of wanting that car content, that automotive content. Um, and we talk about it all the time, we talk about it all the time, but we love doing what we're doing and the way that we're doing it. It's almost like, it's in a weird way, because it's on separate channels, we are kind of doing our own version of, of a TV program around cars. Um, but more recently, I think in the last two weeks, because we spent so much time together, um, not only do we hate each other now, no, I'm joking. Um, but we do talk about how and which ways we can improve and, and evolve our content to maybe produce it on something like Netflix, because I think streaming is the way forward and, and these, these massive companies are investing so much money in that hopefully one day they'll pick up on what we're doing. And the Lamb, the Avenger S is getting closer. Pleasure, <laughs> yeah. Peter Paul Wallace from Supercars of Lambert. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.